Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this session. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Gabriela Fernandez, put together some slides, and I think um, she'll start like uh, briefly introducing the guests. You're muted. This section is called the Beyond Bor Cities Beyond Borders, Rethinking the Urban Metabolism. Um, hello everyone again, my name is Dr. Gabriela Fernandez. I'm a adjunct faculty at San Diego State University in the Department of Geography, as well as the director of the Metabolism of Cities Living, Living Lab, which is part of the Center for Human Dynamics in the Mobile Age in San Diego, California. Carol? And I'm Carol, I'm a PhD student in industrial engineering at the Polytechnic University of Milan. I'm currently based in Italy and I've been working on urban metabolism and pollution topics with Gabriella for the past years. We will go on ahead and start. Uh, the idea of this particular, uh, of this, I think there's someone who is, okay. Okay, the idea of this particular, uh, let's say, um, section is to focus on while materials and pollution can move freely across boundaries and borders, um, a number of issues can happen. The understanding of transboundary urban and social economic metabolism. Issues can include limited transiability associated with different systems for material and pollution monitoring and accounting different policies and measures to allocate resources and keep material flows accountable. A lack of information exchange across borders, uneven use and communication of data analytics, etc. So this session highlights the use and array of urban and social economic metabolism interpreting across the spectrum along boundaries, borders, how can the use of metabolism studies be applied along neighboring regions how can we quantify material energy and pollution along undefined system boundaries? As a result, how can we work towards a standing and transparent monitoring system? For example, that I can be that can be used by my neighboring um, regions. Okay, so the first our first speaker is. Um, we had to change due to time, will be uh, Dr. Umar Kalike. He is from Xi'an Yatong University in Xi'an, China. Uh, and he will be discussing the urban metabolism in light of rare earth material, Mission Mars. Um, to give a, a little bit of a background about uh, Dr. Um, Okay, so, and then we, after that, so that will be the first, uh, let's say 20 minutes. Then after that, we will move on to Alexander uh, Galishin from Partinopi University of Naples in Naples, Italy. We will move on to Dr. Alma Beatriz Navarro Cerda from the Universidad Autónoma de Baja California in Tijuana, Mexico. Then we will move on to Dr. Omar Rosso Perez from the Universidad Simón Bolivar from Sede Cucuta, Colombia. And then we will move on to Dr. Domenico Vito from the Resilience Lab at Politecnico de Milano in Milan, Italy. And we will finish it off with Lisbeth de Schuter um, and Stefan Guillaume from Vienna University of Economics and Business, the Institute for Ecological Economies, Vienna in Austria. So um, Dr. Kalike, if you wanna uh, take it away. Hello, hello everyone. 
So it is an honor to be uh, invited as a guest speaker at uh, International Ecology Day, organized by International Society of Industrial Ecology and by the Metabolism of Cities Lab. And uh, I want to say thanks to Dr. Domineko for swapping his time slot for me. And because it's already midnight here in Beijing time, so I quickly start. I have to share my screen right now. So I think you should have to uh, enable my screen sharing. Go ahead. Yeah. And just to give a little bit of background about Dr. Umar Kalike, he received a bachelor's um, in environmental degree in mechanical engineering from Quest University in Pakistan in 2010. In 2012, he obtained a master of science maintenance management degree from Glasgow Caledonian University in the UK. And he was awarded the CSC scholarship by government of China for pursuing a PhD degree in mechanical engineering from Xi'an Yatong University, China. From 2013 to 2016, he served as lecturer in mechanical engineering department at Natsuri Hushan University and also a visiting faculty in PNEC, NAS, Pakistan. His research interests focus on intelligent pro prognostics, include non-invasive artificial intelligent methods for plant machinery. Take it away. Oh, thank you very much for introducing myself. So I quickly come on to the topic, rare earth materials, uh, RRES, in light of urban metabolism. It's Mars mission, Mars mission. So uh, these are the contents. Uh, first of all, I want to do, give an introduction to rare earth materials, then the environmental impact of mining of rare earth elements or materials, then rare earth elements in light of urban metabolism perspective, and in last, the mining from earth to moon and Mars. Coming on to the introduction, first of all, we should have to know about what are rare earth elements. So rare earth elements occur naturally in the earth. <clears throat> they occur in many places, but are called rare because usually occurs in a small amount. So that means uh, when we are going to extract the rare earth, rare earth elements, so because they are actually, they are really abundant, abundant in, in the earth crust, but it is really difficult to, to do the mining for them. There are lots of processes involved in, in it. So <clears throat> here are the types and usage uh, and applications like rare earth elements or rare earth materials can be divided into two groups, light rare earth elements and uh, heavy rare earth elements. Like length, if you see in the per periodic table, uh, lanthanum, cerium and uh, neodymium that is also extracted by and the last product is magnet and uh, yttrium, europium. So these are some uh, difficult names. I've just uh, pronounced three or four names. So it can be divided into light rare earth elements and heavy rare earth elements in terms of its properties. So coming on to the concentration of rare earth elements in surface soils. So uh, there is a formula and calculations about it, but I will make it simple. But in simple words, the fraction is like 0 0.0067 per kg. So as I told you that it is abundant in, in a quantity in, in the soil, in the crust, but, it's, but it is the quantity is, is, is really less. So here, uh, rare earths are found in a wide range of minerals, uh, like including halides, carbonates, oxides, phosphates, and silicates. Rare earth are the lower atomic weight elements, and uh, it are highly electropositive and are predominantly trivalent. Most RRES possesses similar atomic radii and oxide oxidation states. So that is the that is the point that why 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 its extra extraction or mining is really difficult because they have a lower atomic weight and also they have the similar atomic radii. So that's why. Similar atomic radii means if we are extracting for uh, any particular rare earth element. So because they have the similar atomic radii, so it is really, really difficult 
to extract that because all have the similar radii, then we have to do some more chemical processes. So more chemical processes involved in, in, in it, then that means it will impact on the environment. Sorry, I cannot move my slide. So here are the applications where uh, rare earth elements uh, are used, uh, like mobile phones. Uh, these devices have a short lifespan and RRE recycling is infrequently done. And also every hybrid, you know, hybrid electrics is, and electric vehicles have a large battery. Each battery is made using several pound of, pound of rare earth compounds. Another is like large turbines, some large turbines required uh, two tons of rare earth magnets. So, you know, we are going towards the green energy and we are looking for green energy equipments, but these equipments really in a need of rare earth elements. Without the rare earth elements, uh, I think it's, it's impossible to develop the green energy equipments. So that's why it is really important. So here are the big companies heavily reliant on rare earth materials. You know, the big names, Apple, Tesla, GM, Huawei, Lenovo. So all these companies are using right now the rare earth elements. They are really rely, reliant on rare earth uh, materials and elements. These are the main players, uh, like United States is a major consumer of these products whose manufacturer requires the use of scan, scandium and yttrium, and there will be USP reliant on China. Also, the, the substantial untapped reserves are found in Australia, United States, parts of, part of the former Soviet Union and other countries. Like, if I come into the micro, that was the macro scale, some countries, have these uh, reserves that are untapped, and on micro scale, if I micro scale, if I take some names like M MP Materials in California and Brazil, mining giant whale, copper mine in Amazon, India has recently agreed to export RERs to Japan. Toyota subsidiary is preparing to mine rare earth in Vietnam. Like in Green Day, several companies are preparing to mine and process the, that island's abundant rare earth resources. So here is the uh, estimation of the the production and reserves uh, by 2020 estimates. Like United States, it has a production of 38,000 metric ton and has some reserves. And I will just take the name of United States and China because they are the main uh, uh, resources consumers uh, in terms of uh, manufacturing and uh, consuming. So the China, it has uh, around uh, 0.14 million of production in metric ton. Still, they have a lot, plenty of reserves and, and they are here are in the list some other countries. So if here's this graph again shows about the production of the in metric tons, like the China is on top and then America and then other countries. So this graph also shows the same, uh, you know, the histogram shows the same uh, metric ton of production in different countries. So here is the table overview of global clean technologies in demand at 2016, 2025 and 30. So if you see, I will just take uh, it from 2016, you see wind power, it has 63,350. By 2030, it will be uh, 0.10748 million. In terms of uh, lightning, where there are where the rare earth metals have been used, is like a million CPS. So these are the numbers. So I will take just for electric cars, it is 0.75 million right now, and it will reach to 2.95 million by 2030. And also the rare earth elements have been used in, in the batteries as well. So you see the numbers are, how these numbers are increasing uh, year by year. So here is the environmental impact of mining of rare earth elements. Contrary to their, uh, Sorry. So, uh, uh, so the rare earth elements, uh, like most of them are found is uh, majority are like in 17 in number, but we can further extract to further uh, more uh, rare earth elements from extract from the from these 17 uh, rare earth elements. So the process requires a cocktail of chemical compounds and pro produces a solid waste according to the US Environmental Protection Agency. There are, the rare earth elements are bound up in mineral deposits with low level 
of element thorium that is low level of uh, radi radiation. Okay, now it's fine. Actually, it was coming over my screen. Okay, so the rare, the process requires, as I told that it requires a cocktail of chemical compounds and uh, produces a tremendous amount of solids according to US uh, environmental EPA. So the rare elements are bound up in mineral deposits with the low level of radioactive element thorium. So that is the major concern about if we are moving towards the green energy technology, then, then we are mostly reliant on on the on the rare earth elements and these are the you say the environmental impact of the rare earth, rare earth elements mining so it has low level of radio radioactive element which is called the thorium exposure to which has been linked to an increased risk of developing lung pancreatic and other cancers so during its refining process the plant toxic wastewater leaches into ground and that is storage in ponds are vulnerable to the monsoons that slams to the swampy coastline every autumn Global demand for earth, uh, rare earth uh, dipped last year on the heels so because of uh, the COVID of some of the elements will be in short supply by next year. Here are the effects uh, like if we categorize in, uh, in, a gen in a general way like for water, air and soil, how they affect the water, air and soil. So like a stream flakes and may lakes may be impacted by the leakage of drilling fluids and trees because it it, the process requires drilling. First of all, we have to do the mining. It requires drilling and increased sediments that may alter the water chemistry, causing acid to drain from the rock. Also, for the for the air mining activities, then get, that can release dust and chemical into the air, including cutting, drilling, blasting, transportation, stockpiles, and processing. And soil for soil, it is like water waste, rocks, and dust from the mine may contaminate local soils, which can impact local wildlife and vegetation. So I'm not going into the depth, but I'm just taking some uh, key points of like it can the rare th rare earth mining could impact water, air, and soil in in how many ways. Here are the health effects. Almost all the information about the harmful effects of RED comes from studies of mine workers and other workers who regularly use RED in in mining, where exposure is typically much higher than what the general population would experience. So. At these high levels, exposure to RED are associated with uh, increased risk, increased risk of heart attack, lungs disease, uh, workers who inhale uh, mine dust and metal fumes. Also, uh, it's some abnormal level of some blood proteins. Uh, if children are exposed to RED, it has significant, significantly lower IQ scores. It also affect the synthesis and repair of DNA. Leukemia was associated with environmental population from RES. So, so. So these are uh, the figures I have to, I have uh, given over here about related to health effects. Uh, there I have added the references. So so you can you may check the references uh, later, right? RREs in light of urban metabolism perspective. Here comes the topic of thought. So in light of urban metabolism pers perspective, what can we do? Because we do not have any data collection system, proper system. We do not have any database. We do not have awareness programs of, about uh, the mining of rare earth elements. So for the data collection, there is no single, as I told, RRE market, but each RRE has its specific characteristics and its own value chain, including price, application, abundance. So rare earth, Mining tailing dumps are environmental hazards because tailing easily leaches and erodes by water and wind. So hardly any RRE recycling is applied yet. As I can just raise a question, maybe you have it heard about the recycling of RRE elements. Although the RRE is used, stock was four times as much as the amount extracted in last decades. So there is a, also there is a sparse knowledge and only a few studies about the life cycle of RES. For the database, uh, I appreciate uh, Metabolism of Cities Living Lab. They are they have uh, managed a database related to Metabolism of Cities uh, Data Hub, Stock and Flow Database, Scheme, Stocks and Flow Data Hub, Online Material Flow Analysis Tool, and Global Urban Metabolism Data Set. So what, uh, what uh, Metabolism of City Living Lab 
to please have to pay attention to this uh, to to rare earth elements uh, mining and uh, their data collection still we have the established database uh, with this uh, data database of cities what we have to do we have to collect the data i put it into database so we we will come to know like what's what's coming in from uh, from uh, different countries like china here china is ex, uh, china has a more mining sites but the the major consumer of the rare earth elements is is um, usa so we have to look in, uh, in into this uh, like where it where the rare earth my, uh, elements are extracting and where where it is using in abundance and how is there any policy for recycling is available is there any data is available uh, during my research i haven't found anything related to this no database and uh, there is no any data collection proper data collection for this thing so awareness programs uh, i suggest uh, uh, i suggest the metabolism of sitting living labs uh, that they should uh, have uh, with data collection uh, they should have a database about it and also they should uh, organize some awareness programs like in terms of uh, water air and soil so the ore that contains the RRE can also contains radioactive material so that is really really concerning factor it needs to be properly managed to ensure it does not enter water resources so this charge limits for concentration of metal and other constitutes like radioactive materials must be met before any waste can be released into the local surface water also for the air the ore that the ore that contains the RRE can also contain radioactive which can be liberated during mining activities into the air. So proper dust separation methods for the various potential sources are needed. So for the soil, this rock must be protected from the weather to prevent erosion and the possibility of acid drainage. So the ore, the ore that contains the RAE can also contain radioactive material, as I told. So my phase, my main focus and concerning factor is the radioactive material, so such that any waste rock will have to be properly managed and contained for a very long period of time. So coming on to the end of my discussion. So the demand of uh, RAE, RAE is, is skyrocketing. <laughs> so this is a food for thought, uh, like exploration on moon to Mars mission. The lots of uh, you know news have been heard uh, on the media like US nuclear Mars beginning of age of space mining as space mining as it signs historic trade agreement. Bill, billionaire close to another news is billionaire close to mining the moon for trillions of dollars in rich moon moon richer in metal than previously thought from it is from NASA harvesting rare rare earth metals from the moon will happen this century it is by NASA's chief so why on earth should we be mining the moon so that is the food of thought uh, and that is the end of my discussion. So, because since we do not have any data collection database and no any awareness program while we are here in, on the earth, now we are tailing our head to, to the, towards, the, towards the moon and the Mars. So, so that is a real concerning factor. I think we should have to have an awareness pro at least at least we should have an, an awareness program that should be properly managed and we should have to be aware about uh, aware. Uh, we should have to link our this awareness with the with the with the UNO SGT sustainable development goals related to the renewable energies, sustainable renewable energies, because the rare earth elements are related to this the, to the green energy that means the the most of the green energy uh, products we use the rare earth elements so it is really really important then we should while mining we should have to look for the for the environmental factor we should have to look for the health issues related to this so 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 uh, so that is uh, that's it uh, for for today's uh, discussion Thank you very Thank you much, very Mar. Much. That was uh, really interesting and inspiring. Uh, I don't see any question in the chat as of now, so I think we can move ahead with the next speaker. But please, like question, like come in uh, uh, at any time. I think uh, 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 Paul Hockman had a question. Yes. Hi. Sorry, I'm just unmuting here. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I think it's very interesting to learn about all these rare earth materials. Um, what I wonder, though, is 
I can see a clear link with, for instance, uh, LCA and making sure that, that you have a good idea of the environmental impacts when, when doing that kind of work. But specifically, this is linked in the presentation to urban metabolism. How, how does that fit in exactly? Why is this particularly relevant to, to urban metabolism work? Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, that is the thing I think I should have missed about it maybe. So, because you know, as I told you that uh, from the rare earth, materials, uh, rare earth material, so if you, so if you see a small mobile phone, the small mobile phone has 50 rare earth elements, right? So if we use a, a, a smartphone, it has a very short lifespan, maybe one year, maybe one more than a year, maybe two years. So after that, where this rare earth real is going? I mean, this, where this mobile phone is going after recycling? Have you heard about any recycling pro program related to the rare earth, the products that has used, that have meant, that has included with the rare earth elements? I even, I haven't heard anything related to this because this is linked by, with, with, the, with the environment because we are, we, are doing ex, we are doing mining, we are doing extraction for rare earth elements, we are using for, different products and these products are going to different countries. Like, like I said, China is the major manufacturer who produces uh, most of the uh, products that include uh, the rare earth elements. So where these uh, products are going, either we are properly recycling it, recycling it these, this material, if we properly do a recycling, even, even we don't know, like, even we don't know uh, how much a quantity is coming into which, which country how much country is recycling the rare earth, what type of, how much material is coming into the, into, into a country or in a specific city uh, that contains the rare earth elements, right? So, so we should have to make a balance of it. Like we, sh we should have some recycling programs so we can extract the, these recycled, uh, because it can be recycled, metal can be easily recycled. I mean, it, it involves some processes, but it still, it can be recycled. So instead of doing mining and, and because the increase of the, the mining will be increased because we, the, the major part of the rare earth element used in green, green energy technologies. So we should, have to, we should have to look into that. Like we should have, we should, we should have to do a control, control of that mining. On the other side, we should have to look for the recycling programs. Like it, it should have some part of maybe 20, 30 percent. If could be recycled, then how much big impact will be uh, in on environment to reduce the reduce the uh, the environmental impact, right? So, 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 so we should have to look for how much material is coming to which to to a country, and so for that we should have a as I told you, we should have a data collection. We should have a database. And also we should have an awareness programs related to this. Thank you. Okay, uh, we believe our second speaker is not here. Alexander, can, if you're mistaken and you're here, please let us know. Uh, if not, we can move ahead with the first speaker in the list. Gabriela, do you want to introduce? Yes, our next speaker will be Dr. Alma Beatriz Navarro. She has a Bachelor of Public Administration and Political Sciences, Master and PhD in Global Desarrollo Studies. She is a teacher in the area of Public Administration and Government at the Universidad Autónoma de Baja California in Tijuana, Mexico. She has re in recognition of school merit pre-debt profile responsible for research projects in the area of government and public policies. Recently with the secondary cities project supported by AAG in collaboration with San Diego State University in San Diego, California. Um, Dr. Navarro, if you would like to take, take on over. Thank you, uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay, yes. I want to share my screen. And necesito la función de host. Just a second. Okay. 
Go ahead. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, uh, well, and I'm going to try and make in English, so, but I will need your help, Gabriela. There's no problem, let me know. Okay, um, okay. secondary series uh, is a project um, supported by these institutions, AAG and B Center, San Diego State University and UABC. Um, the title that we did is Mapping to Build a Resilience and Device Robust Emergence Plan, Emer uh, Management Plan. Okay, let me move. Tijuana, what is Tijuana? Well, in the, Tijuana, the city of Tijuana has a population greater than 1 million inhabitants, uh, and according to data co with Coplade. Coplade is um, agents of government here in, in Baja. So, uh, with a concentration of 49.0% of the state population are here in Tijuana. Um, the various economic activities that are development linked with nearby cities such as Tecate, Rosarito, and Ensenada by clusters and connected by the sectors of industry, commerce, and service represents the main driving force for the economic development of Tijuana. In addition to this, these phenomena of migrations contribute in a very important way to this to its grown and urban development, having a very distinctive geographical location. Tijuana has a neighboring with a San Diego city, so um, we had many practice that develop economic and social and cultural integration that enrich the complexity and analysis to respond to the challenges that local regions and decision makers face to face every day. So all of these characteristics has uh, Tijuana uh, is considered as a secondary city. Uh, the goals in secondary cities in Tijuana was uh, the obtain geospatial data, which can be freely accessed by everyone and used by public decision makers. One, uh, sorry, on the other hand, hand in hand with Tijuana San Diego border area, we working together many close with San Diego State University with the course Imagine and Using Disaster Response with Dr. Eric Frost. So we did here uh, in that course uh, in which problems that are shared in by the rich region are study as well as a kind of kind of disaster that can occur in this possible and this possible solutions based on the application of knowledge. Derived uh, from this, the 2C project Tijuana focuses on mapping with the data obtained from uh, to three main aspects, illegal garbage dumps, access and quality water, and line size uh, mainly, acres and flow trace. What did and what do we find? In secondary cities Tijuana, we used to open access software for the creation of data in the field trips, the Optra and OpenStreetMap, and the collection of aerial images we created with a drone, which uh, we process that's, uh, that's images with the technique of photogrammetry to create mosaics, and finally, Argus, we was uh, used to uh, make the maps with uh, terrestrial and aerial images. So this is uh, the general map. All of these places we, uh, we were dead, Laureles, Cañón Laureles, Lomas del Rubí, Camino Verde, Amparo Sánchez, La Presa, Lomas Torina, Rio Tijuana. All of these areas are blue, are, are the Rio Tijuana, is Rio Tijuana, and this is the border uh, with the uh, United States and San Diego and Tijuana BC. Okay, um, these places were um, selected by 
the degree of marginal marginalization with the connected to the river Tijuana. The blue area a la presa, this is the blue area um, that we collect in data in la presa. We found Okay, this is the, the some images of the we collecting. We found um, the, the channels of water, waterways and um, uh, clothed by layered objects like these charms. Another, another imaging uh, very interesting is that because at the foot of the dam, we found the practice the burning the garbage very near to the school in many places like that, like this part, sorry. In Laureles, here, this is the area that we collect in data to Laureles. Um, we, here we have found two types of urine settings like this. It appears that uh, will are structured and will care by the people, obviously. And the other, the other way, um, uh, this the most of the areas on the release are uh, like this uh, with excessive garbage and disorder. Another thing um, that call um, very risk um, these canes bridges that are used by the people that are living here in this we, we take those pictures and images in, in summer, so the channels that don't have water, but in the epoca de lluvias, in the raining, uh -huh, in the epoca de lluvias, it's very, mm -hmm. it's very dangerous, uh -huh, very dangerous. So, Camino Verde, the same, okay, this is the area of the field data collection. Um, Camino Verde, the same practice of burning garbage of the side uh, of the side of the canal, excessive excessive solid gases in channels showing the contamination or contamination very very um, evident. Okay, in many places like that, in many places that uh, the people burning uh, the garbage in the other or the or, uh, around the, 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 the channels. Or um, this, these images, um, we can see a, is a trap, sand trap. So in uh, aerial imagine, um, look like a um, soccer field because the green color from the, from the aerial don't, don't look like a sand trap. Amparo Sanchez, this is the Amparo Sanchez and the, the, the area of the collection data. And they are the same phenomenon occurred with excessive tries on the channels and the made cheese of the bridges by the people who live who lived it, maybe they use it. They build their their bridge very dangerous. Uh, some are better than others, but it's not the security. Okay, Lomas del Ruby. This is the blue area in the land tour. And this is the area with the drone and aerial. And we did this, okay. Lomas del Ruby has a um, trouble of the land side, so I'm going to play again. So this is the, the, the area where we can see houses before and after that in 2019. So the houses were destroyed by the land size. Oh, okay, the next. Okay. Okay. See, uh, this is the, the images of the um, Alan side and terrestrial images. As you can see, uh, this is a big, big um, 
trouble of the land side and also uh, trouble the security because the people here of uh, yet living there. Okay, Lomas del Rubí, uh, pardon, uh, Lomas Taurinas. Lomas Taurinas, this is the blue area of the walking tour. In Lomas Taurina, we can't, we can't take aerial and imagine because it's very near to airport, so our drone can fly. <laughs> um, and Lomas Taurinas, uh, okay, we found the same practice of the burn trash around near to two channels and this is a very common practice in the master Venus. i think that the the place that had many uh, people that they take us um como se dice gabriela forma de trabajo quemar basura uh, it's a way to burn uh, trash ah, okay. a of, of living uh -huh, yes yeah the, the, the people working in, in the burning the 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 trash okay um we found uh we're working water pips and this is water our water clean that it's no no um use it by the way by the best way um also oh, the same practice with the garbage and inside of the channels of throwing the flow of the water and the people living inside in the in the okay in the in these bridges okay this these guys living inside of this these bridges so and with its inside conditions Okay, the same phenomenon of the all the Rio Tijuana, the people living of the gates, con puertas. I don't know how to translate in, in English. I think that the gates of the, yeah, okay, the many people living in that gates of uh, uh, in todo el Rio Tijuana. Okay. So um, we collecting the time um, six thousand and six hundred seventeen imagines. So the, all of this information are uh, open access in the secondary series website. So if you want to to access and download and and use it, you you can use it for wherever you want. This is, this is our team, our students from WABC. And this is my email and my email the, uh, from Dr. Eric Frox, that's a uh, colaborador and professor investigator también del proyecto. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I believe uh, Domenico asked to be next. Since you have some time conflict, so uh, if that's okay for you, we'll move him up in the schedule. Do we have any questions for Dr. Navarro? Okay, there are no questions in the chat as of now, but uh, please continue to ask questions if there's a standing point. Uh, Domenico, the floor is yours. Dominico, are you there? Yes, I am here. Great, thank you for joining us. Okay, tell me where I can start. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. 
Okay, Dr. Domenico, he has a PhD in biomedical engineering, works in the European projects on air quality in Northern Italy. He has been an observer of the conferences of the parties since 2015, the year in which the Paris Agreement was approved by the parties, member of the Italian Society of Climate Sciences. He is active in various environmental organization and networks, the Climate Reality Project, Legambiente, and has been active participant in Yongo, the constituent of young people within the framework conversation of Nations Unite, in which he took part of the various working groups, energy, health, and agriculture, and thematic coordinator of two WGs in United Nations Environmental Program, the MGCY member of GACSA, promoter of the blog, YouTube channel Hubs in Italia for dissertation for dissemination of international negotiations and organizer of the Climate Change Symposium in Climate Social Forum. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Domenico Vito. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela, for uh, the presentation and uh, for hosting me today. Um, I will share my screen to proceed with uh, uh, my presentation. So, the presentation of today is like um, a series of uh, thoughts and also um, possible also ideas in order to foster regenerative uh, economy towards the vision of energy network flows. flows. These energy network flows as, are like a concept that are uh, inside the vision and the framework of urban metabolism. But let's go ahead to like explain a little bit, little bit better uh, the, the few points that I want to, to bring to the discussion. Of course, we can agree all that uh, the current pandemic, but also climate change has been like systemic shocks. Uh, in a way, they uh, like pushed us to change paradigmas and to change also the model, socioeconomic models in which we were uh, settled for years and years. And uh, this can be, of course, seen as also a positive thing in, such, in a certain way because it pushed us to develop community resilience and to rethink the economy. And in particular, uh, this crisis has like phased us to, uh, into the contracts between uh, extractivism and generativity. Uh, we can say that extractivism pertains all that economies that, uh, uh, for example, are the ones that uh, rely also on productivism that uh, drain resources from, uh, from the environment and from the uh, uh, natural settling, setting. Uh, then there is sustainability in between, that is uh, like a, a such of economy that uh, is in equilibrium between uh, the use of resources, the consumption of resources, and uh, uh, the generation of resources. But maybe we can go also beyond sustainability, and we can think about uh, regenerativity. Regenerativity is properly uh, that economy that not only is sustainable, not only is inside the planetary boundaries, but uh, it also helps to regenerate uh, resources and energy. You can see just from this slide that uh, um, energy and material flows are in a way involved in this classification. So uh, regarding regenerativity and regenerativity, regenerative models, uh, there are several frameworks, and basically the definition can stand in the same uh, in the use of the same universal uh, principle to build stable, healthy, and sustainable system. This can be applied in nature, but of course can be applied also in an economic system design. And uh, the Capital Institute has. Uh, design a very nice paper uh, in which uh, it defines the eight principles of regenerativity. And you can see just from the figure that are, there are several of them that uh, also reminds the, the, the reach of equilibrium and uh, uh, the reach of uh, uh, biomimicry uh, in the design process. And of course, uh, in these uh, uh, are involved also the energy flows and particularly the energy flows network and uh, how the things are related. Uh, the concept of regenerativity can be associated to the health of the system uh, inside the, these energy flows. So the regenerative model are the ones that uh, are like 
inserted into these energy flows and in a way enhance the energy of the system and not just drain the energy of the system. And of course, this can be applied in biology, in the cell vision, but also, of course, uh, in the city. And so properly in this uh, uh, biomimic metabolic conceptualization of the system of the city, uh, we can uh, have like uh, a metabolic vision of healthy economies. Uh, that are the ones that uh, use these energy flows, but of course uh, they need also to monitor these energy flows. And for example, in a way, the vision also of smart city uh, can be something that uh, can like foster toward this vision of the city. You have to probably to think like a cell and into the cell there are like processes that produce energy that uh, uh, bring life to the system and so on. And I say probably that uh, through monitoring, uh, there is possible, for example, to um, understand men and measure and also improve uh, the quality of the re regenerative models. Uh, of course, if you monitor, monitor energy flows, you can uh, also measure efficiency. You can measure also uh, impact of uh, the, the um, typical um, regenerative model that uh, you, are, uh, you are applying. And I will conclude this uh, brief presentation uh, that, that I said I wanted to uh, give few hints also in, uh, in, in contribution to the, um, like to the discourse of industrial ecology, urban metabolism, also bringing the regenerativity and the biomimicry models uh, with this, uh, um, this figure. This figure is like the uh, representation of the permaculture principles. Uh, permaculture is uh, like a, a way of design and a way of thinking that uh, was born pr uh, primarily for uh, uh, new agriculture, sustainable agriculture. But this principle that has been developed for uh, agriculture, that is a type of system, can be applied also, for example, in the design of processes, in design of cities and so on. Thank you very much for the attention and I will be open for questions. Thank you very much, Domenico, and uh, also for the short presentation. If there is any question, please go ahead and use the chat or pick up your microphone. Uh, actually, I put a hand. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. I can ask my question. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, yeah, it was a pleasure to see some final article of uh, Brian Fatt about uh, regenerative economics mentioned. Uh, because um, I involved in some uh, projects that uh, related to efficiency that you have been talking about, more like a robust uh, assessment of uh, uh, urban metabolism networks. So uh, in, in which uh, socioeconomic and ecological aspects are integrated together. And uh, the system indices that were introduced by Ulyanovich uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, I um, use them to evaluate uh, uh, exactly in window of vitality where um, if the system is sustainable and the resource efficient. So, so I, see, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's an uh, interesting introduction to, and uh, um, what, uh, what I'm doing and uh, yes, uh, you have a wider scope and um, it's an interesting theoretical perspective and I think that uh, what I'm doing goes uh, as a certain sustainable pathway, uh, which is co complementary to what you are doing. So, so it's very interesting. Uh, um, and uh, I think that uh, complementing this with uh, real case studies and uh, network models of cities can uh, help and advance uh, um, this research further. So I just, uh, not a question, but raise uh, uh, my insight because uh, as a person who are not far from these concepts. Yeah, thank you. 
if I if I can reply, first of all, thank you very much for uh, for the sharing. I'm very glad that uh, uh, you are also working on this on this field. And yes, this was like a first theoretical framework, but of course, uh, it needs also to be coupled with uh, case studies and also measure index and so on. And very glad to to connect in this last slide. Uh, is uh, there is my email, and feel free to to write me in any case. Yes, thank you very much. Great, thank you. I think we have some synergies in um, in this event. Um, is is there any other questions for Dr. Domenico Vito? Okay, since there is no question from the chat, but pl please feel free to ask even later if so. Um, so Alexander, if you want to go ahead and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you and sorry, I have to leave. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Domenico. Bye-bye. Okay, we will now have uh, Dr. Alexander Galicin. He is from Partinopi University of Naples in Italy. He, his research focuses on very much environmentally extended input output analysis of resource efficient urban metabolic system. He is a member of the social economic metabolism and environmentally extended input output section in the International Society of Industrial Ecology. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Alexander Galicin, PhD student, correct? Yeah. Uh, so um, as a topic, uh, I will be present to, to, today, uh, uh, partly related to I mentioned it uh, before presentation, but um, it's more uh, quantitative and uh, um, it's very important, uh, especially for policy makers in developing um, sustainable resource management strategies. Uh, so the topic is a multi-criteria framework for assessing urban socio-ecological systems and uh, emerging access of urban economy and environment. Um, yeah. Before, um, uh, so just... um, yeah. Mo moving further, I address two important uh, sustainable development goals. First one is uh, mentioned it here, is sustainable cities and communities, and supplementary goal, sustainable consumption and production. Um, and uh, the, um, to make it more uh, simple, as we don't have much time, I would say that um, I, instead of focusing on traditional urban metabolism, black box model, uh, which are account of inputs of resources and outputs of wastes, GDP produced and uh, population supported, I focused on internal processes to identify the cause of this uh, um, uh, problems as environmental pollution and also non-renewable use of energy resources. So, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, these aspects are addressed on this slide, which I was talking about. And of course, I uh, address integrated couplet uh, um, systems of socioeconomic and the environment. Uh, so, as a case study as used uh, is uh, Vienna city, capital of Austria. And it's very popular case study because it's the most pro pro productive region in Austria. It generates one quarter of GDP and uh, has the lowest uh, territory and uh, the highest population. Uh, and uh, it's easy to use. It's applicable to my case study because uh, um, most of regions don't have um, uh, urban data available. And when we regionalize national tables, um, it's easy to use um, this case because regional and urban boundaries, municipality boundaries, 
hindsight. So not much uh, uh, data haven't been alterated too much in the process of uh, regionalization. Uh, uh, so I used uh, namely two approaches, uh, which is uh, in input output analysis. Uh, it's a hybrid, I will explain it later. And also energy accounting. So energy accounting, it's uh, uh, as more ec ecological approaches that ecologists use uh, because uh, it allows to use in united framework both uh, economic and uh, energy flows in order to compare uh, total consumption. And uh, it also includes uh, renewable energy inputs and also uh, labor force and uh, investments uh, generated uh, from the larger scale economy and between uh, tertiary industries and uh, industrial sectors. Um, yeah. Uh, so I won't be uh, putting too much in technical details. I will leave it to, to questions and curiosity that might be. So just to make sure, uh, I regionalized uh, national uh, energy and economic uh, supply and use tables um, and uh, to obtain data for Vienna, for both energy and monetary flows. And then, uh, after this were done, I united these flows by using this energy approach I mentioned, uh, energy accounting perspective. So it's both economic and uh, ecological accounting in, uh, in order to produce in common units and compare them. So, so this is a model I used. Uh, and uh, there are some technical stuff that may be uh, not common here, but uh, um, I, I used this in order to uh, generate like energy intensity we have, but uh, I had uh, transformities, which is inverse of energy intensity. So it's in direct indirect energy flows required to make one unit of um, uh, energy flow. So, so it includes uh, um, both ecological work in order to uh, extract the resource and at the same time uh, for human economy in order to process it. Um, and uh, this is the final uh, view of my model that I used. It's a hybrid unit energy input output model. So here are transactions in energy unit and monetary units. Um, I, I separated energy production processes from non-energy production processes, but all of this in energy units because I needed to include economic services provided by energy industries. In this, which most of uh, hybrid unit methodology, uh, yeah, always disregard. Uh, and uh, the result uh, I obtained uh, here we have many results, but uh, um, the most important is, uh, uh, for example, from economic table we can see that uh, uh, industries like manufacture with a high import is um, very unstable and uh, needed uh, for financial investment. So to put it simply, if someone here is economist, it characterized it by uh, highest negative uh, net incomes. Uh, and um, uh, energy consumption results were uh, yeah, more detailed, so uh, we recognize the need for uh, uh, increasing renewable energy use by downstream industries, tertiary industries and construction sector. And also the need for um, uh, upgrading uh, 
production methods and uh, uh, improving production efficiency for construction and transportation storage sector in order to increase its productivity and provide uh, support for um, uh, sectors with all energy consumption like mining sector. So uh, this result is less important is uh, this values were generated because of uh, aggregation it's a limitation of data. So here only man manufacturing sector is important because um, despite being the highest, uh, um, ha having the um, uh, lowest uh, production concentration in the region, it generates uh, uh, the highest output, which is controversial. So, so we, it's clear that uh, uh, something needs to be done with smart uh, uh, production technologies, which is go away from traditional manufacturing methods. So, and uh, uh, what is important from these results that some sectors, like mentioned in the information communication, need to um, decrease their direct energy consumption and uh, improve um, uh, yeah, uh, energy utilization efficiency. And uh, from the last block here, that we see electricity, gas, mining, quarry, fishing, manufacturing sectors, and they have a large difference. This is no, not normal situation. The uh, indirect contribution of sectors in economic terms in, increase with progression along supply chain. Uh, so in this case, to optimize economic efficiency, there are many strategies that need to be done. Uh, so, but this more uh, recommendations. So, um, and this results, as I mentioned before, when we combine energy and economic flows, and we have total energy consumption, we recognize the importance of renewable energy sources in the context of Vienna economy. Uh, we, decide, we found that policy uh, doesn't support mining sector because of um, more for urban mining. Uh, strategies that um, um, utilize materials, buildings, machinery in the city um, as a source of materials uh, and um, yeah, to reutilize steel and um, uh, other resources. So, uh, and um, agricultural sector in, yeah, is given more importance because of its ability to capture uh, solar energy inputs from uh, environment. Uh, so, and, uh, and despite this, it's, support is not enough. So we can see that the sector falls in the uh, same category, despite having more importance to the uh, renewable energy production and also uh, to, yeah, to increase uh, of um, uh, and rationalize use of renewable energy sources in economy. So uh, this uh, electricity, water, severage, waste, and remediation services um, is simply not con uh, over concentrated in the region, so results reflect this. Yes, and um, uh, this one to be expected about A3 industries because they are supported by government and uh, uh, the results reflect this. So, so as um, uh, strategies that can be used is important to apply and supply side demand side interventions. Uh, and uh, of, of course, in the same time to support sector with a low energy consumption. And the, the lowest ones are uh, shown here. So, uh, especially uh, organic agriculture in this case. Uh, so, yeah, and the, the second is reflecting this. So, we see that um, it's important to uh, 
capturing um, uh, not only renewable energy inputs, but also minerals and water for, in order to deliver uh, yeah, yeah, agricultural products in a direct way to all sectors. But, uh, but the most important function is renewable energy uh, consumption and transfer. So uh, as we can see, there are some other strategies that could, could be used to improve economic efficiency of the sectors. So uh, the most, uh, yeah, we can substitute, uh, for example, crude oil with the solar energy and steel. And uh, because they uh, don't have a high price in economic terms. But, and they use more recycled materials. We can use animal waste in order to produce biogas, and, uh, which is uh, important to, for energy demand. So, yeah. Uh, uh, limitations, I will not go uh, through this because it's, uh, um, yeah, uh, just mentioned that uh, um, I had limitation with the data because regional specific monetary data hasn't been available. And uh, because of this, uh, um, results might be approximate. And uh, as a last slide, uh, from from this where we can go so so we can use an energy material flow analysis and uh, also carbon emission accounting with, with uh, when we need full life cycle perspective so considering cool supply chain so so and uh, yeah, there is a perspective on integration with other approaches and uh, um, and applying the last point is applying it to regenerative economy and he part which is uh, uh, affecting the system level resource metabolism so it's more related to uh, robust uh, estimation mentioned in the previous presentation so yeah briefly is a as that's all. If you have any further questions, I will be glad to answer any, maybe any curiosity. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I see there are no questions in the chat as of now, but if you have any, please go ahead. Otherwise, we can move on to the next speaker. Okay, perhaps there'll be a question at the end of the presentations. Uh, so we're moving on ahead, Dr. Omar Rosa, the floor is yours. Thank you. So Dr. Omar Rosa Perez, he's a civil engineer. He specializes in international business. Um, he, is, uh, he has a PhD in educational sciences and he is the director of the Master of Education at the Universidad Simón Bolívar, Sede Cucuta in Colombia. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Omar Rosso. Thank you, thank you. Good morning for everybody. Good morning in Colombia. <laughs> in each of the different regions of the world. And Fidaro, thank you to Dr. Gabriela Fernández from the University of San Diego for the invitation and give us the opportunity to show realities of the border between Colombia and Venezuela. In this talk, I have called uh, Challenges and Opportunities on the Colombian-Venezuelan border. A look at its urban metabolism. Okay, I'm going to present. Okay. Okay, can you see it yet? Yes. Okay. I'm going to put in the in presentation way. Okay. Okay. Um, where is the city of Cucuta? Cucuta, I am going to talk about the, especially about the, the city of Cucuta. 
Cuba, as he said, Colombia and Syria located on the border between Colombia and Venezuela in South America. Uh, Colombia and Venezuela share an extensive border with uh, of 2,219 kilometers long. Uh, mm, the land border line that divides the two countries. Okay. What is the city of Cúcuta? Okay. In the region uh, of the city of Cúcuta, the border is demarcated by the Táchira River. This is um, Okay. This is the Tachira River, divided uh, two countries. Uh, in the photograph, we can see at uh, the right side, San Antonio, Venezuela, and the left side, Cúcuta, Colombia. Okay. Um, uh, the two countries are united through the Simón Bolívar International Bridge. Yes, this is the Okay, and, uh, and the new, in the new image, we can see uh, Simón Bolívar Briggs, uh, which joined Venezuela with Colombia. Uh, in this moment, it's, it's full of people, of Colombian, of Venezuelan people, who is trying to, to enter to Colombia. Yes, people moving across the, across the bridge. Okay, the next. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Colombia, Cúcuta is, a, is a, a Colombian city located at the border between Colombia and Venezuela. Venezuela has 28.5 million inhabitants. Colombia has 50.3 million. And Cúcuta has approximately 800,000 of inhabitants. Okay. Yes, uh, before 2015, Colombia and Venezuela share not a dividing line, but a street of communities. Yes, before the closure of the border, which happened in 2025, 20, life on this border passes, especially in relative peace with the relationship with, the relationship, uh, with help with my brothers. Countries with a cultural, family, economic chain, a chain of goods and services, among others. We did that more than a borderline that divided the two countries, there was a wide street of coexistence between Venezuelan and Colombian cities. Here we can see how the bridge was traveling, but a large flow of vehicles and people. The border crossing was normal in that time, and his country welcomed the citizens of his neighbor. You can see at the left side, welcome to Colombia, on the right side, welcome to Venezuela, okay? But what happened in 2015, Venezuela closes the border with Colombia. Venezuela decided to close the border with Colombia, a situation that totally changed the, the lives on the citizens of this border. We have been generating a great humanitarian and mobility crisis. Venezuela was a very rich country with high income, derived especially from oil exportation in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. Venezuela was the country with the highest income in South America. Unfortunately, corruption led its citizens to opt for a political change, which led to the country being divided and a great social economic crisis began, which had very serious consequences. A strong from the country, such had the fall in gross domestic product having the highest inflation in the world, the loss of the purchasing power of its currency, a decrease on its productive apparatus, and especially a great confrontation between citizens of different political sides. Insecurity took all over the country. 
as a result of that economical, social, and political crisis, many Venezuelans decided to migrate from the country to other places in search of a better future and a safer place to live. Due to all migration, the Colombian-Venezuelan border in the city of Cúcuta became the main exit site for Venezuela from their country and the entry, the main entry into Colombia. Due to this migration, for which the city Cúcuta was not prepared, this border region began to present a great crisis. The consequences of which I briefly describe to continuation. Okay. Okay. We can we, we can see in this slide, yes, faced the crisis in Venezuela and the, or the, or the closer of the border. Venezuela citizens began to migrate from Venezuela to Colombia, crossing the existing trails and crossing the Tachira River to reach Colombian territory. In these images, we can see Venezuela citizens transporting some goods and animals through the river. In this slide, we can see again, yes, we can see make sheep brides yes, with children on their shoulder taking risks when crossing the river. This image shows in detail the large number of migrants leaving Venezuela and arriving to Colombia. Once in Cúcuta, once they arrive in Cúcuta, some of them uh, stay in the city, not all. Others began long walks in groups crossing all the country on foot, to reach other Colombian cities or to go to other countries in the continent, like Ecuador, Peru, Argentina, Chile. They have been called Venezuelan walkers. Here in this image, we can see another group accompanied with children who must walk long distance in the sun and in the water. And this is the Venezuela migration in America, 2020. Yeah. In totally, approximately 4.9 million of Venezuelans have migrated from the country as a result of the crisis. This is approximately 17.2% of the total of the population. We have been dispersed through the American continent especially, and others have traveled to Europe. Currently, Colombia is the largest recipient country for Venezuelan migrants, with approximately 1.7 million, that is 35.3% 30, of the total of the, of the migrants, Venezuelan migrants. In the mass, we can see how Venezuelan migrants had been distributed all over the American continent. Okay. And now, Colombia, we can see uh, how is growing the migrants in Colombia, especially. Colombia is the second country in the world to receive displaced people and migrants. In the graph, we can see how from the closer of the border in 2015, Colombia begins to receive a great number of Venezuelan migrants a year after year. In 2015, only approximately 31,000 entered, while in 2020, approximately 1.7 million Venezuelans had already entered to Colombia. Currently, the Colombian state is granting a temporary protection status for Venezuelans, granting them health and food benefits, especially. 
Okay. Currently, the, uh, uh, in this image, we can see the distribution of Venezuelan by age and gender. For example, a, a female, 49%, and male, 51%, more or less half and half. Yes. And the, the major uh, age uh, is between 18 and 29. Yes. It's the largest uh, migrant population corresponds to that ranks of age. Okay. And now for Cúcuta, more or less a population of 800,000 people. Yes, it has, it has Colombia, pardon, Cúcuta has 100,000 Venezuelan migrants. That is equal to 12.5% new people in the city, suddenly, suddenly. Yes, a high percentage for a city that was not prepared to receive all that amount of people. Some consequences, economic inflation, 2.89%, informality, 72.5%, that indicate that uh, the major of people don't pay taxes, uh, business don't pay taxes, is informal. Unemployment is the highest of the country, 23.7%. Vulnerable population, 53%, the highest in the country. And poverty, 27.9%, that equally is the highest in the country. Yes, the impact of the migration in the city. So consequences of the Venezuelan migrations in Cucut and others. Prostitution, yeah, uh, at, this, at the right side, the mesh, the right side, mm, more than 9,000 Venezuelan children, the grandchildren, entered into to the Cúcuta school system, yes? Cúcuta entered the ranking of the 50 most dangerous cities in the world. Attention, the attention to health is increased. Yes. Political confrontation between, between governments. Yes. Between Bogota and Caracas. And between uh, uh, political os, of the frontier. Yes. Uh, the demand of food increased too. Okay. The situation shown before creates higher urban density with challenges for the urban metabolism, like a city like Cúcuta in the border. But the question is, how affect the urban metabolism in the city of Cúcuta? These are some challenges of this urban metabolism, Cúcuta due to Venezuelan migration. The water resource, the disposal, treatment of wastewater, air quality, the management of the consumption and disposal of waste, the conservation and preservation of the biodiversity, yes, and ecosystem services, movement, people, ecology, garbage, biological, okay. But like there are challenges, there are more opportunities too for the city, for the region and the border. To understand the situation of the Venezuelan border, it is necessary to, to, to take in consideration their adaptation to the interests and geopolitical strategies of governments in a climate of permanent confrontation of action and reaction. In this framework, the militarized control of bordering territories replace the public policies as a way of addressing the various problems in bordering areas. Yes, the conversation between both sides of the frontier are broken in this moment. Having an increase 
of 12.5% of the population in such a short time as a result of the migration of Venezuela of its territory, the city of Cúcuta faces a series of challenges from what it means to have a higher urban density, which generates a disruptive situation for the city, producing an alteration in its urban metabolism. As you know to all, the urban metabolism is key to the health of the cities. In the case of this city, it will allow us to understand to one extent the city and those who inhabit it, it to reduce the intake or consumption of resources if we want to the city to be sustainable in the long term. It is not just about the diet, but about changing an entire lifestyle, resinking the city according to the new reality. Therefore, it is necessary to see for the city to have a much more efficient use of land and transport in addition to the information of technologies and help the city to consume fewer resources and contribute to migrating environmental difficulties, as well as moving towards a society just city with low carbon emission and an efficient use of natural resources. For example, in Cúcuta, Ana Veraz of person produces one kilogram of solids waste a day. This number translates to more than uh, 700,000 stones of stress daily. Okay, one question is, how much of that amount of garbage is recycled? In the city valley, 6% of the waste produced is transformed. Okay. Also, the new realities and dynamics of the city face great challenges. It has a great opportunity when proportion to go from linear to circular resources flow with implies for the city finding new ways of managing the circulation of natural resources in the day. Therefore, the city must implement the use of technologies that improve the efficiency of resources, their monitoring and the reducing of environmental problems, which is one of the pillars of the urban restructuring to become a more equitable and resilient cities. To finish, in my opinion, the concept of urban metabolism must be complemented with that on an ecological citizen, a citizen with a high sense and love for the environment and who is willing to make sacrifices for the environment and sustainability. Okay. Remember, take care of the metabolism of the city. That is to be a good citizen. I hope this time uh, to have detailed information about the data of the urban metabolism. It is, a new, it, it is a new concept for us, yes? And we are learning a lot with the help of Dr. Gabriela Fernandez. Thank you very much. Very regard for all. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. If there are any questions for Dr. Rosso, please go ahead. Or if you wanna keep your question to the end, we can just move on to the next speaker, which will be Lisbeth. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, no questions? Okay. Is that possible? Ah. Thank you, Dr. Rosso. I think that uh, we're going to wait in the chat to see if there's any questions for you, but uh, I really appreciate your presentation. It was very insightful and informative about the situation between Venezuela and Colombia. 
So thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you, everybody. I'm happy to stay here today. A great thank experience you. and a lot of information for us. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, now we will turn it over to Lisbeth de Schuter. She is a part time lecturer at the Chair Group of Urban Economics at Wanningen University and associate researcher at the Institute for Ecological Economics of the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Lisbeth is enrolled in the PhD program Social and Economic Sciences at WU. Um, her topic is Transformative Pathways Towards a Sustainable European Union Bioeconomy. In her research, the focus is on urban-rural interactions and dependencies in food and non-food bioeconomy activities. Please give a warm welcome to Lisbeth. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela, for this introduction. Um, yes, good day, everybody. Uh, at last, <laughs> welcome also on behalf of the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Um, this last presentation on city, cities beyond borders from an urban metabolism thinking framework. Um, yeah, I want to thank you up front for organizing this session. I really like the topic, which I take as, uh, as very relevant in the context of, of addressing agents' responsibility in, in an urbanizing world. Um, yes, I will introduce uh, our current work on urban food metabolism from a spatial sustainability perspective. It is a small research project related to my PhD thesis, uh, supervised by uh, Stefan Gilliam at uh, the Institute for Ecological Economics here and uh, by Evelyn van Leeuwen at Wageningen University. Um, is it not moving? Uh, do you see my screen? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. It's moving to click twice. <laughs> um, urban food systems. Uh, yeah, a system perspective on food, on urban food, is becoming more urgent since more than half of the world population lives in cities right now. Since two thousand ten, actually, already more than half of the world. Um, and important in this context is that even a larger share of the global population um, consumes food in an urban system, in an urban context, about 70 to 80 percent, as estimated by the FAO. Um, from a spatial systems perspective, cities are mainly consumption hubs, you could say, although they also embed some uh, production activities. Um, but mainly they are dependent on rural hinterland elsewhere. And um, yeah, I think making that makes consumption based research perspective increasingly important. Uh, from a, from a socio economic perspective, then cities are connected huh, in food cities are connected to economic activities elsewhere to employment to income of people in the global food system which emphasizes the need for for fair and just remuneration of food and and their producers um, in an urbanizing world which is expected to continue at a high pace um, the fao emphasizes the need to leverage um, to address subnational and local government action to ensure sustainable and resilient food systems uh, for all. And so, yeah, the research question in this, uh, in this work is basically how can growing cities contribute to more sustainable, and that is then understood as safe, nutritious and just um, food systems from a spatial perspective. Uh, yeah, full slide. Um, this research uh, has been uh, carried out in parallel with an urban uh, metabolism uh, approach. Um, and I will briefly introduce uh, what has been done there and, and go on, uh, take it from there. So the urban metabolism is an important tool to promote responsible flow management and reduce environmental burden from urban activities. Uh, and so it has also been used uh, to uh, analyze uh, food activities. Um, however, um, uh, there is there's 
it is, has been noted that there is a lack of an explicit focus on food, of detailed food products in urban metabolism research, uh, mainly because the majority of impacts occur outside urban systems. Um, yeah, this requires considerable efforts to collect bottom-up food consumption and production from an urban perspective, uh, as well as related material flows. Um, Building on urban metabolism, um, hybrid approaches have taken food uh, on board um, in, in a more explicit way, for example, by uh, an urban metabolism approach connected to LCA, which has been done in a study of Go in a Goldstein uh, study and in uh, a recent study of uh, Stellwagen et al. Um, or by replacing the uh, material flow analysis by any company-wide physical input-output framework. In general, those uh, hybrid approaches, the, especially the urban metabolism LCA approach, shows that urban metabolic flows are underestimated. And uh, for food, in, for example, uh, in particular in food and transport, they are, they are hotspots in environmental loading related to urban metabolism processes. And that impacts can be communicated in a more common, in more common, uh, common environmental indicators. They had the LCO, LCA approach allows the urban metabolism uh, flows to be uh, translated into indicators that are uh, more commonly applied in, in policy frameworks. In food, um, hybrid uh, urban metabolism approaches highlight, uh, the results of those studies highlight that there is, uh, seems to be a linear relation between GDP and food-related material and nutrient flows, in, in particular because of waste. Um, that animal products uh, or animal-based products are main drivers of urban food footprints, um, that food is also important in the context uh, of solid waste generation, in particular packaging materials, um, that there is a marginal recycling of food and human waste in urban contexts, and basically in, in any context, I, I guess, and that the importance uh, of the consumer's last mile in transport-related carbon emissions is, hi is high. Um, so, in particular, um, urban metabolism-based approaches have been able to connect final food consumption at the urban scale with supply chain-related impacts uh, elsewhere in terms of land use, eutrophication, and global warming, which has already been an important step in, in taking the urban metabolism basically beyond borders. However, there are also some limitations that have been noted in relation to those uh, urban metabolism-based approaches. Um, in, in particular, they, they are limited in terms of addressing and evaluating spatial relations and responsibilities in, in this case, the global food system. Um, yeah, that, that is, of course, evident because there's a limited coverage of economic structures in, in LCA-based and urban metabolism approaches outside uh, of the urban system. And therefore, they cannot take indirect effects. Uh, so, for example, the machinery that is necessary to produce the packaging materials are, in fact, also part of the food system. Um, those uh, urban metabolism uh, LCA approaches are not uh, capable of taking those indirect effects on board. And that's also a consumption activity. Uh, a recent paper by Boylan et al. Uh, therefore claimed that policy efforts towards sustainable food systems, and I quote, call for a framework in which different aspects of food and nutrition security can be measured under identical scope and where policy simulations arrive, which arrive at multi-indicator outcomes, are comparable. Uh, one of such frameworks that could be used for this purpose is environment, environmentally extended input-output frameworks um, because they use the network of global economic relations, basically trade flows, um, to allocate environmental impacts uh, to production and consumption activities um, in the global economic network on the basis of harmonized physical and economic data. 
urban metabolisms, and that has already been done, uh, can be connected to those global environmentally extended input-output frameworks, both in terms of physical and in terms of monetary flows. There was an, uh, a study uh, done by uh, on Barcelona, on the urban metabolism of Barcelona, connected to an input-output model by Shafi already in 2013. Um, environmentally input-output approaches can capture the vari variability and complexity of context-related food systems, provided they include relevant spatial levels of food system analysis. And in general, so far, um, many food-related studies uh, have been carried out at the national level. And um, yeah, also in discussions in those papers, you can read that um, it, it, it often is, is too aggregated and, and uh, modeled in a way that the context uh, specificities of food systems are not covered yet in a, in a sufficient way. Um, in this study, uh, we try to, um, to develop a spatial food system analysis of a city. It is uh, the city of Almere, which is a middle, medium-sized city in the Netherlands, has 200,000 uh, inhabitants. It is a fast, this is actually the fastest growing city in the Netherlands as it takes uh, all, um, uh, people from Amsterdam that, uh, where, that uh, look for a place elsewhere. So it's located close to Amsterdam. And um, it is also located in an arable uh, uh, production environment uh, in the province of Flevoland. In this study, we take a multi-level approach. So we um, uh, look at the city level, at the provincial level, at the national level, the EU level, and so on. And basically, this would allow to test theories like the Fontaine and Rings to see how um, um, food supply has developed over time. Um, MFA-based food consumption accounts have already been uh, developed for the city of uh, Almere in this parallel study that I mentioned. It is basic, it is not entirely an MFA study, but it is uh, uh, based on um, diets that have, that have been uh, analyzed in an MFA approach for the city of Amsterdam, uh, um, distinguishing ethnic minorities. And based on those um, ethnic groups in Almere, we have been able to uh, develop the, mm, the more, a more specific dietary pattern or basically food consumption for the city. So we take a consumption-based approach, which means that all consumed foods by a population within a defined geographical boundary, in this case, the city of Amir, uh, including embedded resources and environmental impacts in important, in important goods. Um, it, is also, it is a quantitative approach based on secondary databases uh, on a survey and uh, complemented by non-survey-based input-output modeling assumptions. Um, yeah, basically the results um, will look at um, environmental and uh, socioeconomic impacts of the current food system of Almere. Uh, it takes an integrated analysis of food system impacts in terms of uh, things like value added, employment, and on the other hand, uh, land use, uh, nitrogen pollution, phosphorus pollution, water use, so you, that you get kind of a yeah, uh, uh, an integrated framework of uh, food uh, impacts. In a second step, once the current system has been uh, analyzed, we will develop a scenario analysis. This is still work in process, progress, where uh, we would um, assume a, a sustainable diet uh, for the city of Almere based on the Eat Lancet uh, recommendations. Um, a second scenario would be uh, the current system in, that moves towards more regional sourcing, so sourcing products that are produced in the province of Flevoland, which basically is uh, vegetables, dairy products and fish. And, uh, and there is also an, an implicit target already defined by policymakers in this context, where they move towards, where they want to move towards 25% of regional sourcing. 
And uh, a third uh, strategy um, that we would like to model in our framework is um, an increase in urban agriculture, which is also an implicit uh, policy assumption where they would like to provide, to produce 10% uh, basically of vegetables within the city boundaries. Um, those scenarios we would combine to see kind of have what is the maximum sustainability potential of these three types of strategies. And then uh, we would also look at this um, scenario in a population growth perspective, because the city is growing towards 2050. Um, the methodology, uh, yeah, basically uh, it is a regional uh, input output analysis. So we um, had to uh, construct regional supply use tables uh, with a high food system uh, resolution. Uh, for that purpose, we, um, we used the global uh, multi-regional input output framework of Exio Base. Um, it has a high number of uh, agricultural and food sectors for uh, 49 countries and regions worldwide. Um, so we use the Netherlands in this framework as the reference uh, table um, and from the, or basically as a, as a first step we had to construct the urban and provincial supply use tables uh, based on uh, different sources, uh, physical food and agricultural supplies from the National Statistical Office, animal feed consumption estimations based on uh, a module of uh, FAO. Um, we had to trend, oh, sorry, can I go back? We had to go uh, to translate it in monetary flows based on uh, unit prices provided by the statistical office. We used Eurostat agricultural accounts and regional business statistics, labor statistics, and we carried out an interregional, um, well, a survey on interregional trade flows. Unfortunately, mm, that, that was interesting to find out because the region of Flevoland is a very is actually the most efficient um, arable producer in the Netherlands and it's very much focused at uh, exporting to the world market. So for them in this in this because we also started to uh, phone them, uh, it turned out that they were not very interested in supplying the city because they would have to restructure their supply chain. It was an interesting finding, but it resulted in a low response for our survey. So therefore we had to, to uh, turn to non-survey uh, estimations of um, the trade flows between those subnational levels, between the city, the province and the rest of the Netherlands. And we basically followed uh, a methodological approach of uh, Catena in 2019. He uh, wrote an approach for um, uh, urban um, trade flow estimations and include uh, the charm uh, approach, which is uh, which includes cross holing in a way that you uh, you can import more food um, than you actually need because you uh, you further process it and you and you export it again. Yeah, the methodology maybe it's it's too long for this purpose. I think the most important part is that um, by constructing these tables. Uh, we could take out the Netherlands from this multi-regional input-output database and replace the Netherlands by these three tables. So by Almere as a city, by the rest of Flevoland and by the rest of Netherlands. So then instead of 49 regions, hey, we took out the Netherlands, so you have 48 plus three uh, regions. And um, yeah, basically this is a, a standard Leontief model where you, uh, where you calculate a Leontief matrix as a multiplier uh, for the environmental extensions here. That is the footprint um, where S is the intensity uh, vector, which uh, is able to uh, calculate or, or show the environmental pressure per unit of output of X. And when you multiply it with the Leontief, um, inverse ma matrix and the demand vector, then you uh, are able to see how, um, yeah, what are the environmental and social economic impacts of this urban system in the global environment are. Um, I already mentioned where, what we looked at. Um, 
well, I can skip this because this is the scenario analysis, which I already explained to you. Yeah, basically the first result is, is so the, the multi-level uh, MRIO here, it is an abstract of this table because it contains, of course, many more regions. But here you see um, the inter-industry part of the input-output table where you have the city of Almere supplying outputs to final demands in Almere and the rest of the world. And where it also uh, uses inputs from uh, other industries and other regions, as well as uh, factors, uh, labor uh, in, and value added uh, factors in, um, in other regions. So these are the social uh, extensions and also environmental inputs like land, water, biomass, etc. And by this, um, yeah, here you have the final demand, which also distinguishes the household level, the government and the firms. And uh, when you change then uh, uh, something in this final demand structure uh, in an input output model, which is a demand driven model, you can then calculate what would be the change in this, in the urban impacts in the global environment. <clears throat> yes, I. I must uh, confess that when I uh, when I proposed uh, my uh, uh, when I applied uh, my research proposal, I thought that I, that I would be ready with the scenarios. But um, well, unfortunately, I'm still working on the results. So these are these are preliminary results of the current system, and um, I am not able to show you the scenario results yet. But um, here you can see, uh, for example, the um, a spatial uh, biomass perspective of the urban uh, of the urban system. So basically, you can see that the city of Almere has has hardly or almost none biomass uh, production that it also consumes. Uh, that there is also a very little uh, biomass uh, consumed from uh, the province or from the neighboring. Uh, region and that the majority of biomass is supplied by the national level. Then you can see other regions, the neighboring countries, Belgium, Germany, rest of uh, uh, countries in the northwestern part of Europe, which are important. Um, yeah, this is not maybe a good aggregation because if you would add up all the European uh, regions, it would be larger than the other um, distant regions, but you can see that also Central South America, um, surprisingly Africa, which we still have to look at because it's very high, um, but also Asia Pacific is important in, um, in the spatial biomass footprint of, of the city of Almere. And you can see that in the neighboring countries, it's mainly, basically grains, um, and these the gray uh, uh, parts are um, animal or basically cattle based production. And uh, in the distant regions, it's mainly um, related to vegetable fruits and nuts and also to other food products. Um, yeah, I think it, there's too little time to go to this um, also because yeah, the results have not been really analyzed in a structured approach, but I, it just shows you that you get a spatial perspective on different aspects and dimensions of uh, the urban uh, metabolism uh, in, or urban food metabolism. Um, so here you see the, um, the land use, cropland use, which has a bit of a different approach. It's much less cropland use in the Netherlands because it's a very intensive uh, system in the Netherlands. Here, um, which is hard to see, I think, but it's the nitrogen uh, pollution footprint and the phosphorus pollution footprint um, also related to the um, urban metabolism of Almere, where you can see that nitrogen concentrates in, in northwestern Europe, you could say, but that phosphorus is also um, uh, a big um, environmental, a significant environmental pressure in distant regions. Um, sorry. Um, then here, uh, one slide on the, um, uh, the spatial value added perspective. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I must say that we took into account, um, so the 
the retail sector and the restaurant sector and allocated also biomass to them because they have uh, food losses and um, and value added uh, is then uh, the food losses are at uh, sorry um, sorry no this is the value added perspective related to um, to the food system of Almere where you can see that the majority of value added is generated in the retail sector and in the foods uh, or the food service sector you could say the restaurants um, that the other important value added dimension of um, or, uh, Almere's food system is uh, occurring in the rest of the Netherlands and that there is relatively little in, in the rest of the world, um, which is of course, um, yeah, you can expect that, but, and I think that is one of the conclusions, you can see that there is a considerable environmental dimension elsewhere, whereas the value added dimension tends to accumulate in, in, um, the, in the region, uh, in the urban in the urban region itself and in the at the national level. So discussion, yeah, that basically relates to the problems I encountered uh, when I started analyzing the data and wanted to um, to develop the scenarios. That basically the product classification of um, multi the global multi regional uh, input output databases are not so suitable as a reference framework. Um, because in high income countries, uh, a large share of consumed foods are processed foods and they are, according to the product classification, uh, they are all classified as food snack. So that makes it already harder to distinguish really uh, uh, at a product level what is uh, the, uh, the effect of, of an urban metabolism approach uh, in relation to input output analysis. Um, Furthermore, uh, manufactured animal feed is also part of food snack, and that really distorts uh, the analysis. Um, so that is a, a, a finding uh, where we deal with now. So we actually need to disaggregate animal food, animal feed uh, from um, food snack. So in this product classification system, um, which uh, can be done on the basis of a physical MRIO database and then multiplying it by feed prices, but that is uh, still some work to do. Um, yeah, there's a need for higher food product resolution in multi-regional input output analysis in order to provide impactful and actionable scenario analysis to, to policymakers and other stakeholders. And from a methodological perspective, uh, we think that there are potential syner synergies in link of linking physical input output, so MFA based approaches and monetary input output databases to support bottom up food system research. Um, eventually, these um, physical frameworks may even replace environmental extensions. Eh? Environmental extensions are allocated on the basis of the value of the monetary flows, but it would perhaps be better to link them in a concordance matrix uh, on, a, on a, also on a specific uh, algorithm. But then you can are better uh, cap you are better capable of uh, knowing how certain impacts are allocated. Conclusions: Urban consumption hubs can potentially contribute to more sustainable food systems by acting on detailed, spatially explicit footprint analysis. Um, in particular, more reliable footprint analysis in multi-regional input output would benefit from linking economically oriented and MFA derived databases. <clears throat> uh, in, in what I tried to show today, um, uh, the, the preliminary results at the disaggregated food product and spatial level point at the concentration of socioeconomic benefits in uh, in the countries and urban system uh, in West in, in rationalized economic activities at the national level, whereas environmental impacts tend to accumulate in uh, more distant and often because uh, because of their production advantages they are located in tropical and subtropical rural rural regions potential urban food system strategies um, include adopting policy measures that support a more sustainable and healthy diet and, and that um, is linked to the global food system uh, as well as regional food sourcing policies that help reducing transportation related emissions and short supply chains of plant-based foods that would uh, address uh, the regional food system. 
and by learning about circular circularity, food preferences and ecosystem dependencies in urban agriculture, you would uh, you would distinguish a local food system. So an urban food system and the approach that we apply kind of disaggregates this <clears throat> urban food system into three levels that have different features and also different um, ways to approach. Finally, um, the retail and the restaurant sector, as well as households, of course, <clears throat> are key actors to include and address in urban food strategies aiming at more sustainable food systems. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. We're actually out of time, but we'll be very happy to save you more minutes to take any question about these or previous presentations. Actually, I do have a question for you, Lisbeth. I was wondering if you use or if, you, if you're interested in uh, usual, using remote sensing approaches to assess like the uh, spatial systems. I am not. Uh, I am personally not working with with remote sensing approaches, but um, yeah, in the team I'm working at in uh, in uh, at the Institute for Ecological Economics, um, yeah, there is a, also in relation to mining or especially in relation to mining, um, there is a fine print an ERC funded project also led by. Uh, Stefan Gilliam, and they uh, yeah, incorporate remote sensing approaches also related to land use change, uh, have land use change in relation to mining. And uh, yeah, that is a very um, spatially disaggregated approach that uh, they are working on. Yes. That's very interesting. Thank you. Are there any other questions about this presentation or a previous one? I see there is uh, Alexander, you raise your hand. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, actually I have many questions about this presentation, but I keep it uh, very short. Um, firstly, um, uh, as, uh, as I understood, uh, you applied um, uh, supply extended input output analysis to uh, calculate footprints. Is it right? Because I, I saw. Uh, sorry? Um, can you repeat your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you applied uh, supply extended in, in input output analysis in, uh, in order to calculate footprints because I see your formula where you is the of matrices and density factor and the uh, yes. Uh, but, yes, but um, like I explained, I, I first um, also took a commodity by industry approach and uh, produced the supply use tables, which in a way you could also directly use to calculate environmental indicators, but um, it was easier to to align with the, the system of the Netherlands to use uh, yeah, the input output model. So that's why I turned towards input output table where yeah, in a way you lose some information. Yeah, but that's what we are doing. Uh, yeah, because, um, um, because depending on your extensions that you choose, uh, supply or use extension, uh, you can have different results. Uh, yeah. If uh, you, it's based on your assumption, if extractive industries are more responsible for, uh, uh, yeah, uh, understandable food consumption, or it's uh, use between uh, um, uh, non-extractive industries uh, is responsible for so. So, it depending on this, it can be. Uh, yeah, some challenges with the uh, results obtained. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that is a valid, a good point. Cool. And, sorry. And yes, uh, I uh, could yeah. take um, different um, allocation principles um, on board to see what what the differences would be. And just uh, it's not a question, just comment. Yeah, uh, I, when I calculate, uh, had a similar approach, with, and it showing that um, retail sector 
had a high, much higher consumption compared to other sectors, footprint, I mean, it, it seems uh, close to reality because of uh, long supply chains in order to, where we have many extended um, uh, consumer market and, and many retail stores or uh, manufacturing who sells. So, so this yeah, seem, seem very close to, uh, yeah, I could, uh, I could agree with similar interest is that uh, it can be as high as in your results. Uh, and uh, the last thing, very briefly and short, uh, if you need to integrate physical and uh, monetary input output uh, uh, tables, um, this perspective that I use is very useful. And, uh, in, it can benefit uh, that you objective in um, uh, when you need to integrate physical and uh, uh, economic data convert it to the one unit of measurement and uh, uh, have uh, total impacts and, and compare it so it's very useful uh, um, to apply this uh, perspective to this research. Yeah. Just uh, a brief hint. Yeah, although to the, to the last point, um, yeah, it's also quite um, complicated in a way that you have to be very careful with your um, allocation, also again with your allocation principles or with your concordance matrix. It's uh, we have also here, um, my colleague Martin Brockner has developed uh, a biomass-based input-output table, uh, which is a physical input-output table. And there uh, one could look like, but still you, it's, it's a different product classification, uh, which flows are going into animal feed, which flows are going into processed foods. So there, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's of course, of course, still complicated. Uh, yeah, of course, con concordance is the first step, but if you resolve this uh, uh, yeah. problem, uh, the next, uh, yeah, after this, it would be very useful to apply this accounting perspective. Mm -hmm. But of course, if uh, concordance de have been dealt with. Great. So I think that there was a lot of different interpretations of what, how we rethink the urban metabolism from border issues, from food cycles, and different methodologies of urban metabolism. So for some of you that are, have been sticking around since the beginning, do you guys have any questions uh, to any of our, of our speakers? We still have Lisbeth, Alexander, Alma, and Omar. Okay, well, I just want to say thank you to everyone. I think that it is very important to share this knowledge. For example, I know that uh, Dr. Alma in, in Tijuana, uh, uh, she has in, in, in his city, in her city, uh, some equals problems than, than us here in the border too. And maybe in another time we can complement experiences uh, between us. Yeah. And I, I want to thank everyone. Thank you. Best regards for everyone for this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Gabriela, Carol, Mayoni, Stu. Thank you very much for joining and, and also for sharing this very interesting uh, perspective of like people movement in addition to like material movements, which are, which I think we're more, more familiar with. So it was really interesting to see a different point of view. Can I speak? <laughs> okay. well, thank, thank you very much for this invitation. It was a really amazing for me. I could cool share the we did in the secondary series and also i i can see that we have uh, many um, things that are similar with the investigation of the dr omar rosso from peru from peru right no no from 
Colombia. Colombia, Colombia um, and Venezuela, okay. Colombia, Venezuela, yes. No, but I think that you have, you are from Peru, but I make a mistake. <laughs> so, um, in the future, maybe we can share and, and share and, and compare that, that research because also here in Tijuana, the phenomena of the migration are very, have a very impact by the, the neighbor with the US. So may, many people that uh, other countries of the, of the South come here uh, to, um, with the expect to cross to US, but stay here in Tijuana. So it's very interesting that your investigation, Dr. Omar, Thank, Thank you, Dr. Alba. Great. I think yes. there could be some great synergies there, definitely. All right, Carol? Yeah, absolutely. Also, we're happy to connect any of you if, um, if you feel like there can be any collaboration after this uh, presentation. Okay, if there is no more suggestion or curiosity or uh, question, I think we can close it here. Uh, thank you very much again, everyone, for participating and for showing your research. It was really interesting to hear from all of you and to see like our, uh, that we share some common interests in urban metabolism and also like taking it uh, far beyond um, the current research streams. So thank you very much again, everyone. Have a good uh, day, a good evening, a good night, depending where you are, are in the world. And I hope to see you around. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, yeah. Thank you for this great yeah. session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.